The Victoria Cross is Australia's highest military honour. It is defined by being presented to persons who, in the presence of the enemy, perform acts of the most conspicuous gallantry or daring or preeminent acts of valour or self-sacrifice or extreme devotion to duty. Corporal Daniel Kieran from the 6th Battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment was awarded the Victoria Cross for his actions at the Battle of Derapat in Afghanistan on the 24th of August, 2010. Now he's just written a book about his life and time in the army entitled Courage Under Fire. And as a former 6th Battalion soldier myself, I was very proud to have the opportunity to sit down and talk to him about it. Dan Kieran, welcome to G'day from LA, mate. Well, g'day from Australia here in Brisbane, from my uh, office. Still working from home due to COVID, but uh, thanks for having me this morning. Mate, I miss Bris Vegas, man. I really do. Well, mate, you miss it even more at the moment. It's pretty good. <laughs> I hear it's pretty <laughs> with you guys at the moment. Uh, well, what I've seen on the news anyway, it hasn't been great. So uh, for those of you who have been affected, uh, my thoughts are with them. Yeah, it's a bit rough, bit rough out this way. Um, so... Where are you? are you from, Brizzy, originally, or are you from somewhere else? Mate, I was actually born, born in Nambour, so I'm a Queenslander, clearly. Uh, I'm not sure if my uh, skin's great uh, in the Queensland sun, but uh, anyway, <laughs> mate, I do burn rather than go around. But I, I, mate, I've always been a Queenslander, and uh, I grew up in, in the bush. And uh, when I was 17, as, as you will find out, I, uh, I moved to Brisbane for uh, defence purposes. And so, I've, look, I'm, Brisbane is my home, and it has been for, for many years now. So, you're 17... Why? Why the army? Why? Why the? Why not? Why not do anything else other than that? Uh, mate, look. In all honesty, uh, for me, it came down to opportunity. Uh, as a kid, and you know, my, my dad came on the scene. I, I hadn't met him until I was twelve years old for the first time. And I was living in Queensland at that point in time at Mullaney uh, on the Sunshine Coast, and, okay. and he rocked up. He'd, he'd just been shot, so you know, wow. that's a pretty normal, normal upbringing as a kid, right? Dad, yeah. dad rocks up. Haven't met him. Uh, being shot in the chest, decides, well, actually, I'll go back and step his girlfriend. So keep in mind also that he was married to my mum at that point in time. So my dad's girlfriend rang my mum and said, oh, you know, Ian's been shot. Um, he's on the way out. He's dying. Uh, and actually, my mum, being the, the great person that she was, said, uh, look, come and, you know, come and stay with me while you recover. So she uh, took him in again. <laughs> I said, I should say again, because it's been a few times over the years. And but that was the first time that I'd, uh, I'd met him at the age of 12. And he quickly convinced my mum that it was a good idea to, to sell up and pack up and move to a little place called Lomead. Uh, Lomead's about 100 kilometres north of Bundaberg. So it's a, a country town. So I grew up with uh, dirt floors, no man's power. You know, I, I literally used to strain my drinking water because it had mosquito larvae. The wow. wigglies in it. Yeah, yeah. So look, I, I grew up out in the bush. <laughs> Very much so. That's crazy, mate. So, so you end up... So you end up joining the army, you go do basic at Kapuka, and then you end up at the School of Cool, you end up at Singleton. <laughs> How's the adjustment for, for a young soldier going from Kapuka to Singleton? Because I know what it did to me. It was a shock for me, uh, that's for sure. Mate, honestly, and I, and I, you know, I, everyone handles things differently, but again, it goes back to my bringing as a kid and you know, the resilience I think that was instilled in me, certainly from, from my time on the farm. From, from growing up, with, let's be honest, not much, to, to having a grandfather who'd served in the Second World War who, who told me a few stories and motivated me and inspired me and you know, instilled a certain sense of, you know, personal ethos core values in me to then join defence. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't find it that hard, in all honesty, from, from the structure that was associated with what it was in Kapuka right. then going to the, the School of Infantry. Um, and I, I learned about, well, I learned a lot about myself, in fact, and... You know, I, I remember there's you know, a story that I tell where I was really ready to quit one day and I'm, you know, I'm digging this bloody hole at, or a pit. Uh, one of the instructors had asked me to dig several times in different locations. Uh, keep in mind, I hadn't slept for, you know, three days. I hadn't been fed <laughs> for about three days as well and kept on moving the location of this pit and I was ready to quit. And I remember having a conversation with my grandfather before joining up and, and he said a couple of things to me. And I always say this, because I always get it out there because it's, it's important to me and, the two things he said in the first, not so much this conversation, was you need to, you, know, you need to work good, you know, need to work hard. Good things will happen in life. But the second thing was, you need to find out who you are as a person and what you represent. And for me, I knew I wasn't going to quit. So for me, at that point in time, my training, although it was hard, physically hard, um, I certainly wasn't going to give up. 
That's pretty good. That's pretty good advice. I had someone give me similar advice at 6 RER. They basically told me no matter how hard they yell at you, they can't take away they, your birthday and they can't make you pregnant. <laughs> that was what I was told. That was, that, that was, that was the, that, yeah, but my, I think your, I think your grandfather sounds a little bit, a little bit smarter than the person who told me that. <laughs> so, so you get to, you get posted to your first unit. Where do they send you first up from the School of Infantry? Went uh, straight to Brisbane for 6 RER and I, uh, I had a very distinguished career at 6 RER in Brisbane because I spent nearly 11 years there. I dodged every promotion I could, uh, did the courses that I could and, and deployed on, on operations a number, a number of times, but those deployments were posted out of six briefly. So I got right. back and then come back on again, right? So I, I, <laughs> I managed to stay in Brisbane for a Location, day. location, location, mate. That's what it comes down to. Gold Coast, Gold Coast. Yeah, love it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, got a, I've got a personal question here. You've done a lot, you did a lot of jungle work uh, between East Timor, a uh, couple of trips to Butterworth, uh, Canungra down in southeast Queensland and uh, Tully in far, far north Queensland. What is the worst jungle you've, environment you've worked in? Because I've got my own theory on this. Uh, 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 I think the worst one is the one you're in when <laughs> currently, but for me it was uh, Tully, hands down. Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah. That, that, that's, <laughs> that's definitely the thing. I, got to, I, I, was, I was driving an Uber out here in America at one point and a bloke jumped in the back seat of an American veteran and he said, oh, you're an Australian infantry guy. I said, yeah, he said... He just said Tully, and I went, uh, and he looked. I looked at him. I went, "Oh, you've been there." And he goes, "Yes." He goes, "You bastards!" <laughs> he couldn't believe. He said he couldn't believe it. He said, "There's something, anything like it." And that was that was what used to work with me. It was, I was like, you know what? Wherever I am right now is going to be horrible, but it can't be as horrible as that. Look, uh, that is a very good point, and, and I often relate that same sort of thought process to. <laughs> oh, sure. But yeah, that, that's that's my benchmark for, for horrible horrible <laughs> crap is is Land Command Battle School, definitely. Uh, that was yeah, a horrible place for me. So, so, your, like, first so your first deployment is Timor. Um, I found when, when I, that, was, that, was, that was the only deployment I did. I found straight away it matured me. Is that what, it, did it change you straight away from being uh, a young fellow being 18 or 19? Yeah, look, I mean, it, it did. I mean, at the first overseas trip, the first time that I'd been on an aeroplane, the, you, know, the, you know, the first time that I'd been away was over Christmas period as well for me away from family and friends so a lot of firsts for that for that trip um I think I was fortunate that it was very much a peacekeeping operation and I was pretty young and, and green as they say and and you know I, I think I am lucky in that regard that I throughout my career I had a stepping stone of you know from peacekeeping operations to warlike service to the threat evolved and was more you know severe as it went on during my career so for me yeah I, I was very fortunate to to go on a deployment at that point in time that taught me a lot about myself and, and my skills and, and certainly uh, shone a light on some of the things I needed to improve on as well. So uh, I know a, uh, I know a lot of soldiers have like a like a like a senior digger or a, or a mentor they look up to. Did you have anybody at that time uh, guiding you through the process? Uh, loosely, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Look, they did, but you, you're right. I mean, those times have not changed. Certainly with the military. Um, where they still have the, the senior digger or senior individual within the team and, and they do take you under their wing and, and, and you know, impart knowledge uh, in various ways. <laughs> uh, on, uh, you know, so it is, you know, it is still very much done to this day. And, um, you know, I had a number of people within the platoon that I was fortunate enough to, um, to have as mentors. I'd call them mentors now. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, look, I, I certainly, and I do professionally now as well, still sort of have that mentality of, of having a mentor in your life. So look at it, it certainly, um, you know, had that ability to reach out and, and ask those tough questions. And if I didn't know the answer to and, and be a better soldier at that point in time. Yeah. So what's the next, what's the next deployment after, uh, after East Timor, you're back from East Timor. What's the next, what's next on the, on the, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for me, it was, uh, as you mentioned, you know, a couple of RCB trips. So that's uh, rifle Com company, Butterworth for those mm -hmm. that don't say that. So it's Malaysia. Let's be honest, there's a lot of drinking usually uh, on, on those, on those sort of trips, but there's a lot of training as well. Yeah. There's a number of different, you know, number of different um, you know, reasons for going across that with government, government relations and a whole range of things. But uh, for me, it was uh, you know, a couple of trips to, to Malaysia or one before Timor and then one after Timor. And then a number of years later, the, the first uh, trip over to the Middle East and that was uh, Iraq. So I went across as a, a Bushmaster driver for, for those that don't understand Bushmaster is an unarmored vehicle. And I was one of the uh, the first people uh, qualified on this new armored vehicle, and, and was lucky enough to get a trip 
and I went across with um, the second battalion or two RAR at that point in time from from Townsville. Um, so I had a platoon of six RAR guys from Brizzy um, head up and and go across uh, with with the boys from Townsville. So that's a that's a wild place. I spent four years out there as a, a contractor for for the US Department of Defense. I was a fobbit. I didn't leave the fob ever. I found, I found, my, found my office and hid in it basically for four years. But <laughs> one thing I did notice and out there is the amount of debris and trash running around as a driver. How do you concentrate on the IED threat at that point, considering they're hiding these things in just about bloody everything? Yeah, look, I mean, that, that, is, that is a question, isn't it? And, and it's part of being, well, being part of a team as well. And you've just got other guys and girls, for that matter, with their heads above the, the vehicle looking for disturbed earth or signs and that. But, uh, yeah, look, it, it was very sobering to, to see vehicles, certainly, that were still burning whilst driving along the road that had been hit. Um, so at that point in time, the IED threat that I was in, in country in 2007 was, you know, it was pretty high. Uh, and, you know, we did a lot of work to avoid main roads and, you know, we did a lot of work with um, explosive ordnance as well to go out and disarm them. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, the precautions that you take, um, you know, they mitigate to, a, to, a, to an extent the risk, but unfortunately they don't uh, eliminate it uh, and you know, continue did, to... Did you guys go... Were you under a lot of fire in Iraq at the time? No, no, mate, no, not at all. I probably got shot at three times in, in seven months, in all honesty. So... Uh, for me, that was the first time I've ever been shot at. Someone was actually trying to kill me. Um, East Timor, no, you know, it was nothing like that for me with the United Nations. But Iraq was was uh, very different in that regard where, you know, you know, engage with RPGs or rocket propelled grenades and, and small arms fire with coordinated attack from multiple levels. So it was, uh, for me, I think the first time in, you know, seven years since I joined in 2000 where right. all of a sudden I can employ the skills that I've been training for so many years. Um, and it was over, you know, a battle over in the blink of an eye. Uh, adrenaline, the peaks and troughs, and, and then it's gone. So you mentioned, um, you mentioned in your book, basically, you had a break between deployments for two weeks, essentially, coming out of Iraq. How much of a surrealness is in your head, basically, leaving a war zone for two weeks and then just coming back and just dropping straight back in the fight? Uh, so, that, so that was part of the, the Rockwell experience. That's, you know, you get two weeks off in between. Uh, and I actually went to the States. I went stateside. I, uh, I went to Vegas <laughs> for two weeks, mate. Well, I went into, I flew into LA and I went, drove up and did Vegas and San Fran. But I, um, it, look, it was bizarre. So I, literally I was getting shot the day that I left country, getting shot out, <laughs> uh, you know, vehicle taking rounds to getting on a plane to, to being, you know, in a casino you know, sitting in a class by the side of a pool. Like, it was bizarre. And then going back, um, you know, flying into country, and then all of a sudden, you know, you've got your body armor on, you're back in your greens or, you know, whatever, and you've got a rifle again. And you're out on, out on patrol within 24 hours again outside the wire. Yeah, it was yeah. a strange experience. Yeah, I think the scale of that entire operation over there, no, I don't think anybody, anybody who, unless you'd been there, had no idea how big that operation was with the Americans when they get, when they, when they take the whole... The whole kit to, to war, they take the whole kit to war. <laughs> Look, they do. And, you know, when, when I was there, when I was over there in Iraq, it was for me that we moved from our little Australian base. It was a multinational base at that point in time, but you know, there's a couple of thousand people there. And I went to the main base at Talil and, you know, there's 30 something thousand people, 35,000 people at this base with, you know, the pop up McDonald's and, you know, subways and all these things that we were just blown away by the scale, as you said, where, you know, the logistics associated with it. Um, it's like a, a little a little base hidden in a war zone, nearly surrounded by uh, Hesco baskets um, or walls. So yeah, it, it was it was so strange. You drive outside the wire, and it was a you know you're in a, in a foreign country, but then you come back in, and it's like a little piece of home, or you know different sort of countries have set up their own little areas. Um, it made it, yeah, it was so bizarre. That there was so, I keep on saying that, but it was. It's hard to describe. Oh, no. I used to get stuck in traffic on base, driving to work on the base I was at. It was 11 miles around the, around the fence. And yeah, it was one of the more, more insane things you ever see. You know, a 22 minute commute to get to work in the morning from one side of the base to the other. It's just, it's just nuts. So we get back, we get back from the deployments in Iraq, deployment in Iraq and Afghanistan comes up. How does that deployment shake together? Yeah, so for me, look, it came around really quick, a number of months, in fact, whereby I had the qualifications, I had some experience up, 
uh, Special Operations Task Group. So this is our uh, Australian Special Forces have started going into country doing, at that time it was coined uh, Kill Capture Missions. Uh, they changed the name and the mission later on, but uh, at that point in time they were doing direct actions where they'd go in and, and prosecute high value targets. And, and that was what they were doing for a number of years there. So I went across to support them uh, and I got that gig uh, through one of my soldiers put me forward. So, you know, uh, I'd obviously done okay up until that point. And um, uh, it was a very short list of individuals that were selected. And you know, I think it was six drivers or seven drivers wrong that went across to, um, to support special forces at that point in time in, in 06 or seven. Okay, cool. We just got a quick, a quick throw to our sponsor, mate, who's making this possible. So a quick ad to our sponsor real quick. Uh, this is a quick shout out to our sponsor, CPAPRx.com. Do you wake up every morning feeling like garbage? Feeling like you've just run a marathon in your sleep? Well, you might be like me and one of the other 20 million people in America who suffer from sleep apnea. You need to go check out our sponsor, CPAPRx.com. They're the leading online supplier of CPAP machines and accessories. And today, g'day from LA viewers, get 10% off CPAP supplies and non-RX accessories with the code g'day with three A's. So do yourself a favor and go and check out CPAPRx.com today. Make sure you use those codes for CPAPRx.com to get those discounts. Okay, so we're in, uh, we're in Afghanistan, mate. August 24, 2010. How does this day shake out? Uh, for me, okay, so the, yeah, so we've jumped forward a bit. So that was um, 2006 in Afghanistan the first time. Then, then back in 2010, you're right. It uh, was a very different country. And what, so I'll give you some context first before okay. getting into it because it had gone from a country where it, the shoot threat, meaning that you know you drive outside and you get shot at, to a country where you drive outside and you get blown up by an IED. So all the IEDs and that, that had, you know, that started coming into country mm -hmm. and the tactics had changed dramatically. Um, so for us, you know, the 24th of August, 2010, I'd, I'd started off again in these Bushmaster vehicles. That was, I suppose that's where I spent a lot of my time and finally got the opportunity to dismount. And my role had changed that of a, a mentor to the Afghan National Army. So I was there to train the soldiers. Um, so essentially we'd, we'd taken over a new patrol base uh, from the French, so I think there's French Foreign Legion soldiers there and some um, some Dutch forces and that uh, in the area of responsibility we're going to take over, and uh, and our you know we were given the mandate of, of training these guys, but also it was their mission, so we we're handing it back to the Afghan National Army soldiers um, to run you know to run their missions okay. and all. So they decided they wanted to go up this particular valley. Um, now, when we had taken over this area, we were told if you go past a certain northern you're going to get shot at. Like, there's just an invisible line in the sand. If you go past that, every, they're happy for you to go to that point. And if you go past that point, you know, that you've gone too far and they'll start shooting at you. So, um, so naturally, we, we decided, then Australians, that we're going to go up and have a look and, and go past <laughs> um, And sure enough, we got shot at. So that was on the 22nd of, of August. So then from that, we, we formulated the plan. So we spent two days planning as to how we're going to do a clearance mission of the village. And... Um, you know, we, we stepped off on the morning of the 24th and, and we had extra assets. So we had labs. So that for those that don't, lab is a, an eight-wheeled armoured vehicle with 25 millimeter chain gun on it. So, you know, fires a, a projectile, you know, high explosive round out to, mm -hmm. you know, three and a half Ks very accurately. Um, so we had a number of vehicles in support and, and mortars, so indirect fire and Apaches on station, and fixed wing assets. So we had the whole works lined up you know, if we needed it. And we also had a, another um, platoon that had come out uh, to support us. Because I should add at this point in time, there's only 24 Australian soldiers out of this, this patrol base. So it was a very small little area. It was a, you know, it's a, a tiny little thing out in the middle of the, right. the fringe of bandit country is probably the best. These, these are all 6 hour guys? Uh, they were. Yeah, all 6 hour guys. So 24 of us. Um, not wrong. Sorry, there was oh, there's still a 6 hour battle group. There's right. an employee and, you know. The support elements. Support elements as well. But um, so I remember stepping off out of that patrol base that particular day and our engineers, so we had an engineer detachment as always because of the IED threat and change, mm -hmm. as I mentioned before. And I had a real, yeah, try, you know, really tough time for search the ground trying to find IEDs um, because of high metal content. So it took them a fair while to search some vehicles in to support us. And they noticed droves of women and children leaving. So picking up from the, the village, so they'd say us moving in, picking up and, and leaving, but there was no fighting aged males with them. So, you know, it's a combat indicator, as they say, the atmospherics yeah. were, were wrong. We knew something of potential was going to happen, and sure enough, you know, it did. I remember getting into the, the actual village itself of Derrick, it was named. 
we married up with our other supporting elements that had come out to support us. And as we were walking through, it was like a ghost town. You know, it's a, a scene out of the Wild West, if you will, of, you know, tumbleweeds and no one, no dogs. <laughs> it was so bizarre because you just, dogs barking, you're trying to bite, your kids running around, farmers, not a thing. You're just Clint Eastwood walking down the street at this point. Yeah, mate. It was, yeah, yeah. Guns drawn, ready to go, but it, there was no one there. And, well, that, that wasn't until we got to the last building, one of the last buildings in the village. I remember going around the building and, and as I've looked up, um, probably 80, 70 metres in front of me in an aqueduct that they used to irrigate, there's a... There's probably a televan fire there with a, a PKM, which is a machine gun, and decides to pull the trigger and, and put a burst of machine gun fire straight down. Well, probably wasn't right at me because there's two guys in front of me, <laughs> probably aiming at them, but he, he missed me by about a metre. So it's hit to the left-hand side of me, struck the ground and struck the wall um, straight to my left. And straight away, I, you know, as you're taught, you, 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 know, you look at your surroundings and you identify the high ground, the low ground, the, you know, the terrain that yeah. you're dealing with. And, and straight away, I knew I knew that there was a, a hill to my right-hand side that would provide me a, an elevated position that I could get a, a good angle to, to fire if required. So I, I ran up this hill straight away. Needless to say, someone just had shot at me, so the adrenaline yeah. dropped. And I, I'd gone too far, <laughs> as, as you do. Ran too far, like you did that I was. And um, I'm standing on this hill, essentially, and it's it's me uh, that's got my, my, you know, my big nose hanging out on top of this hill. And it wasn't just one guy. Turned out that the, you know there's probably a hundred guys waiting in a, in a sort wow. of semi ambush waiting for us, and they all saw me in this from several locations up this valley. Turned and started firing at my location um, because I was the only one they could see, and uh, I used my, my big nose to great effect and used it like a shovel, mate, and, and got to the ground as fast as I possibly could, like a worm trying to crawl off the top of this hill um, as bullets started flying in and over my head. So I knew very quickly that this is pretty serious. Like yeah. being shot. A lot by that point in time, like we, we've been in a fair bit of action, but nothing, nothing like that I'd experienced until that point in time in my career. That was the largest group of people you'd run into at that point. You that, they they weren't really congregating in that kind of size group. No, so up until that point in time, we you know we'd hit maybe five guys max, maybe five guys, and most of the time it's farmers or you know a small insurgent group would have a bit of a crack, an opportune target, right? So they might lay in, lay an IED, they might crack off a few RPGs. Right. A small, uh, you know, engagement lasts maybe 20, half an hour. And as soon as we'd start to manoeuvre tactically and assault or, or try and take ground, they'd just drop their weapon and, and hightail it back into the population. And, we'd, we, you know, very hard to, to pinpoint exactly who it was. Um, so, so how did you counter the ambush with these guys? Uh, so with, with firepower, essentially, we had our labs, um, vehicles roll up and start engaging very quickly. Um, you know, we, we had probably 40 each soldiers on the ground. So I, I ended up having all the machine guns up on, up on the hill where I was and created a support by fire location whereby we'd, we'd do all that, you know, keeping the, the uh, enemy's head down essentially by weight of fire and then we'd have another mover, a maneuver element would come around and, and start assaulting forward and, and gaining ground, gaining, physically gaining ground. Um, so that was the plan. And, uh, and that's what we started to enact. You know, it was an attack order essentially. We're up the guts and, and here we go. Uh, Look, everything was going pretty well uh, until about half an hour into this. And when I say half an hour, that's, you know, it's a fair while. And the whole mm -hmm. contact, I think, lasted about three hours and 45 minutes. That's a long time for the weight and the ferocity of fire just and what was going on to last that entire time. But it did. Yeah. Really, that, that 30 minute mark, um, I was on the hill and I remember hearing, very strangely, hearing a, a cry or a scream over the noise of battle, which was so bizarre. I hadn't heard anything like that before. Um, and I remember looking over to my left-hand side, some sort of 50 meters, and I remember seeing one of my friends, uh, he was on his back on the hill, on a hill. And I, and I thought that's a strange thing to see. And, and it wasn't him that had screamed out. It was one of his mates beside him had yelled out. And I remember, you know, I was still getting shot at, keep in mind. So I remember, you know, weapon to my front, you know, engaging targets. And, uh, and I remember looking over again, and it was probably five seconds later, all of a sudden, you know, ripping off his clothes, his body armor. And I hear the call over the radio, he's been shot, uh, but he's been shot in the arm. Uh, I didn't think much of it. I thought, oh, well, guys get shot, arms, leg, whatever, you know, put, a, mm -hmm. put something on it. Had a medic there, I, I knew the medic was close by. Getting back in the fight, like he'll be back in the fight in a matter of minutes, right? But um, that wasn't the case. As I remember looking over it, probably only 15 seconds in total had passed. And as I, as I looked again, you know, they'd managed to, to nerd him up essentially because they're trying to obviously find entry and exit wounds. For, right. 
those that are not familiar, if you if you get hit by a bullet, you know, often it, you know, it's a small hole or it goes in and there's a big hole at the back, depending on, you know, size of everything else. So, so that, we won't go into the details of that, but right. trying to find out what was going on. So, um, and there's a guy there doing CPR. So literally on his knees, in contact, literally getting shot at, um, doing CPR. And I remember seeing that, yeah, going, if someone doesn't do something, and, and when I say it, when I mean someone, a uh, commander, and I was a, a commander on the ground, if someone doesn't do something, there's about seven soldiers are all about to die. Because uh, they were still getting shot at, the Taliban right. had started moving moving around and were flanking us from the left-hand side. And um, so for, the, for those, again, unaware, a flanking maneuver is, you know, it was on flight fire, fire, meaning that they could get rounds across our position and, you know, a very dangerous situation to be in. Um, so I remember having a quick conversation with an Australian gunner that I had at my feet and informed him of my plan. And it was a pretty simple plan. It was to, well, there was two reasons for my plan, actually. One was to try and draw enemy fire away from the casualty. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing all the rounds, you know, literally coming in around them. And, you know, I thought if I present myself as a target, one, they can shoot at me and it will give them time to do what they needed to do and drag them off the hill and, and yeah. two, it'll help identify targets. So having real problems for identify targets um, due to, you know, distance and, and a whole range of um, factors. But, uh, but I remember seeing this hap happening and standing up and, and taking three steps forward and hearing that very familiar sound of a bullet as it travels up past your head, which is like a whip cracking. And the closer and closer that it gets, it changes in sound. I remember hearing this <laughs> and that it started ra running to my right hand side. And um, it was one of those crazy things where it actually worked. It, it, uh, it stopped the fire from falling around my team and, and the casualty and my mate Jared right. and, and started chasing me along this hill. So I, I probably ran about 50 meters. There's bullets in front of me, there's bullets behind me there. I've, you know, I've slowed down, I've sped up. I'm like, I'm committed now, here we go. Um, somehow I wasn't killed, but it worked. You know, one of those crazy things, it actually worked, whereby the fire did switch. And I thought, you know what, well, if it worked once, it's gonna work twice. Then I was gonna say, how many times did you run up and down that hill? Well, I was along the top of it, yeah. So I did, th I did three runs in total along the top, um, drawing enemy fire. Uh, I should have been dead the first time, but, you know, Second time was crazy. Third time, you know, I, I should be dead, really. So I, look, I really should be dead for what I did the third time. But then I came back a fourth time as well to help to help out with um, the Kazabak or the, the helicopter coming in to, to get him out of there. But I mean, this is the thing that I justify it by the fact that I, I had plates on, so I had body armor on. Right. So I had a, you know, a plate front and back, um, I had Kevlar on as well. So I I'd hoped I'd take one on the plate. Um, but I knew if I, if I didn't, again, I had faith. I had absolute trust in my team that they would grab me and drag me off the hill and throw me on the helicopter if if I had got shot. Okay. Um, the soldier who got shot, he didn't make it, did he? No, he didn't. No. So, most probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was was walk back from that contact site. So getting shot at that day after you know three hours, forty five minutes, knowing that we when we threw him on the helicopter, and unfortunately, I've seen enough enough casualties over the years and, and those that didn't make it to know that when we put him on that he had passed away. Um, but we had hope that if we could get him back to further care, you know, something could be done, you know what I mean? That hope of, right. of driving you to act. And, and unfortunately, yeah, he was, he was pronounced um, dead on arrival when he got back to our, our further um, medical facility. And, and we found out later, in fact, he'd been shot through the arm and went straight through his heart and killed him instantly. Um, and we, we couldn't have, wow. no matter what we did, Unfortunately, we, we wouldn't have been able to save him. Um, but, yeah, so out of, the whole, out of the whole contact, we, uh, there was just one, one, one fatality and, and you guys managed to basically save everybody else who was there. You guys came away uh, with a couple of injuries? Yeah, I wouldn't say save everyone else. Look, we, yeah, we had an Afghan soldier. That, look, oh. there, was, there was, yeah, so we took one casualty. We, we you know, inflicted pretty heavy casualties on the, on the enemy that, that day. But, I mean, losing one guy is, you know, it's, it's never great. It never justifies the means. Yeah, as far as, like, do you ever so. consider? Do you ever? Do you ever think about what the uh, the Afghans were thinking as you kept running back and forth up that hill? <laughs> Man, it's, look, it's never crossed my mind. But look, we had a great from that point in time. Uh, we had a very great relationship with them because I think they realised that we were really, you know, we were willing to risk our lives and to to better their not just their training but to better them and, and their country. And to you know, we kept on saying that we. Are not here to stay. You know, we always got that question. You guys coming? You know, no, we're not here to stay. We are going to hand. You know, we are giving you the skills to succeed. 
Don't ask me how that's going now, mate, because it's not going well. But you know, that that was the mentality that we we had, and you know, I could see the good that we were doing. From I was right. fortunate enough like I said to go from a number of deployments over years, see the infrastructure, see the change in culture, see you know, see the positive change. But um, right. yeah, yeah, it's not the case now. Unfortunately, it does move at the speed of politics. Unfortunately, but uh, so the next day you go back to work and do the same thing again. How do you get your head back into going back to and back to just patrolling again the next day? How does, how do you decompress? Yeah. I mean, that's, that is the thing because you are, you know, you're in a live, you know, there's no, there's no scenario. There's no training. You were there and you're behind essentially enemy, enemy lines the entire time. I mean, you're behind a wall, but I mean, that's it. You know, if they wanted to, they could have attacked us that night um, and, and, and got back into it. But, for us, I remember bringing, it wasn't just me, it was my sergeant, actually. Um, we, we brought the team together and, and we did. A, it was a, a debrief, but it was also a, an opportunity to grieve because we knew exactly that, that we had to get back out the next day. And, and it was a, a sit down and a check in. And for me, I, I think, you know, I certainly learned a lot up until that point in time about leadership, but it, certainly about motivating and inspiring people. Right. And for me at that point in time, okay, that was really hard when I was... You know, I'd actually injured myself, not from, you know, getting shot or anything, but I'd, I'd injured myself physically. I'd pushed myself so hard that I'd, I'd actually needed surgery and I got back to Australia on my legs. Um, Shit, man, you're lucky you didn't pull a hamstring, to be quite honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, the worst thing's going to happen. But, yeah, I, you know, yeah. it was one of those things where it uh, it was. We, we had sat down, did a debrief, we spoke about it, and, and, you know, it was a check-in. It was to see how everyone was going. It was, guys, you know, the, re- the reality is that we could potentially have to do this the next day. And, and I do remember that, that chat and I won't, you know, that's, I'll keep that private as to what we right. said, but it was, it was one of those things where, you know, it was inspiring for those that were there to, to realize that um, we were truly at that point in time forged together as a team with shared goals and objectives. And I think it made us stronger from that point in time for, with each other anyway, and, and knowing that each other was there for each other. So you come back from that deployment and decide, okay, I'm done. I'm, I've had enough of the army. Uh, I'm going to go back to Civvy Street, and you end up in, out in Kalgoorlie in the mines. I tell you what, mate, you're glutton for punishment. Jeez, you couldn't fi- couldn't find an easy job. You're going to go out to Kalgoorlie and, and get in the mines. Then you get a call from the chief of the army. How does this go down? Mate, it, it, exactly right. I uh, I did start in the mines over in WA, blasting underground. Another sh- another safe job, right? From, from <laughs> military operations to, to blowing up hard rock underground, but. Uh, but you're right. I, I'd done a, I'd done a chart. I'd like it. So the last crew that it was on had, had blown something up, and um, I think that overcharged it because they'd blown down all the vent bag inside. It was smoked out anyway. So I'd come up, I come up early uh, to wait for it to clear out, and the phone was ringing in my locker. And it was the chief of army, and naturally, right, because the chief of army rings everyone. And, oh, of course. But I, uh, I thought I was in trouble. You know, one of those weird moments. You have, like, and it's probably not very tasteful saying this now, just in light of everything that's happened, certainly in Australia. But I thought I was in trouble. I thought I was getting done for something that I'd done wrong in country, honestly. Yeah. You know, the war crimes elements being thrown around everywhere. And I, I could put my hand on the heart and say, look, I've never done anything wrong, but I've certainly been in a lot of, you know, firefights. Um, right. So that, 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 that trip. And I thought, Christ, he's, he's rung me because I've done something wrong in there. They've come to get me. Um, so that wasn't the case. Uh, it was, you know, he said he had the jet. And naturally, again, you know, I've got a jet. I'm coming to Kalgoorlie. Uh, I want to see it at the Kalgoorlie Airport in, I think, four hours' time. And I had to explain to my, my team and my crew and my ship boss <laughs> that they needed to take the day off. Even, again, I had no idea what was going on. Um, right. No idea at all. And I remember getting to the Kalgoorlie Airport and and uh, he got off the plane, the chief of army, the RSM, and, and walked over with purpose. And it was a one-page, a four piece of paper with a number of, like a tick and flick box on it. You've been nominated for the Victoria Cross. Uh, it took you if you accept it. No, if you don't accept it, nothing further will ever be said and it might be recorded in the history. So, you know, I was given probably five minutes to decide. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, honestly, I had no no opportunity to talk to my team how they thought, um, you know, of this whole situation. I hadn't hadn't really discussed it with anyone um, and had to make a decision on the spot. And for me, it was, you know, it was, it was a tough decision because to this day, even to this day, I still don't think I'm, you know, deserving of, of uh, an award like the Victoria Cross, you know, it is a, the highest award in the award system. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, should I be dead for what I did? Yeah, probably. 
Um, did it change the, the course of the battle? Yeah, it's debatable as well. But I, you know, tactically, that's a whole different bag. But I, I still don't think, you know, I'm deserving of it. So I had all these things running through my head. But at the end of the day, I, I thought, you know, this is an opportunity to, to talk about the great work that others do. So this is, it's never been about me because I wasn't there alone because I would be dead. I know right now I would be dead if it wasn't for my mates supporting me and my team there for me. So it gives me an opportunity to talk to you and then people and, and talk about the great work that goes on um, for those that choose to serve and those that choose to wear the uniform of the Australian Defence Force. Well, speaking of that, we've got the book Courage Under Fire, uh, written with Tony Park. Um, how, do, how, how does that come about? How do we get to the point where we're like, you know what, a couple of years later, let's do a book? I know, right? Look, uh, yeah, look, uh, not, not, for me, look, it was a natural thing. So I, uh, after leaving the mines, and I had another opportunity, obviously, after receiving Victoria Cross, has you know, broadened my horizons and, you know, doing all sorts of things, from working for, for Channel 7 as a guest presenter occasionally to keynote addresses to travelling to... Well, I think I, I flew to LA one day and I was in LA for a day to do a talk and then back home again. So for me, um, I decided to do my executive master's in business, uh, mm -hmm. so MBA here in Queensland and at QUT. And one of the units there was negotiation and, and I thought, oh, what better idea than to, to do sort of a negotiation on a book deal because it's something that I sort of thought about. Never thought I'd do it, but it was, you know, it was a relevant subject. Yeah. And, um, but I, you know, I started getting into it. I spent so much time researching it and, you know, business case, the whole works, right? And, and I thought at the end of the, that unit, and probably the end of my MBA, you know, I thought, well, what's actually stopping me from doing this now? Um, you know, I've done all the research here. I, I know the players. Uh, so I said, yeah, why not? Let's do it. So I decided to do it. Otherwise, I would probably would have still to this day not have written something down except for that experience and that opportunity. Well, it's so that's, a that's it's, it's a ripper of a read, man. I, I, I loved it. My mum put me onto it. That's saying something right there. My mum called me and said, I read this military book. I went, what are you reading military books for? That's not your bag. And she said, it was for a guy from, a guy from your unit. And I was like, oh, oh, wow. All right. And she goes, yeah, it was fantastic. She read it in three days flat. I mean, wow, okay. That's my mum's a machine when it comes to reading, man. That's, she's, she's focused when it comes to that. She says, you've got to get this. And I was like, all right. And I had a look at it. I was like, wow. It's, it's really a really a good read. Um, you're working with the Australian War Memorial now? I am, yeah, yeah, doing a number of things. So I'm, I'm currently on the board of the Australian War Memorial. So I'm also on the committee overseeing the redevelopment as well. So it is a, a very, you know, I mean, naturally for me as a veteran and my experiences for me, I, I do see it as, you know, such an important place that tells the story of, again, those that choose to serve our country. And um, I've been doing that for a number of years now. And, Another two years on my term. So uh, I love Canberra and I love the institutions there. But yeah, the Australian War Memorial has had a, a special part, uh, will play a, a special part in my life, yeah. It's fantastic down there, mate. Uh, having seen what the Yanks have done out here, nothing uh, nothing holds a candle to what they're doing down there at the Australian War Memorial. It is, it is a completely different uh, setup than what anybody else has got. So Dan, you're awarded the, uh, the Victoria Cross in 2012. In 2021, does do you look at it differently now as you did back then? I mean, what has what has changed in your perspective of the award? Well, man, that's a tough question. The, the award itself, I mean, it, you know, in a way, I'm a, a custodian of, of what it represents. Like, there's been so many, you know, inspiring people that have gone before me that have received, you know, a Victoria Cross. So, has the war look? It hasn't changed. Has my life changed? Yeah, massively. Has it changed me? Look, I'm still that kid from the bush, um, without a doubt. And but it's it's forced me. You know, I don't think I would have done an MBA. I don't think I would have changed careers. I don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing now, with without those experiences as well. Um, so look, I, I still, as I said before, I'm still reluctant to to say that I'm deserving of something like that. But I don't think it's the meaning of it, the actual medal itself, and what it represents has changed for me now. So, folks. The book's called Courage Under Fire. It is not available in the US right now. But when we put all our posts out all the time, we see everybody getting care packages from Australia with Vegemite and Wheat Bix and Twisties and Shep. Next time you go for a care package to Australia, tell them to get down to Dimmicks or get down to a bookstore and pick up a copy of, of Dan's book, Courage Under Fire, and put it in there with your Vegemite and your Wheat Bix and all that gut, gut, gear you get sent over to America. Because I guarantee you, you won't, you won't put it down. You'll read the thing from cover to cover straight away, just like I did. 
So that's a massive plug. Mate, mate, that might give me the, uh, the inspiration to actually look at international publishers, which I haven't done. So there might be an option there for me to, to get, uh, get motivated and do that myself as well. Mate, Dan, thanks for stopping by. G'day from LA today, mate. It's been a pleasure to have you. And uh, yeah, I'm proud to tell you came from 6RR. I'm proud to interview someone from 6RR in your position. Mate, been awesome. Thanks so much for having me today. Cheers. Cheers, mate.